Hello and welcome to We Own This Town Music, the podcast for showcasing new and notable music from Nashville and surrounding areas. I'm your host, Michael Leeds, and this is volume 215. This show is part of We Own This Town, a podcast network of original entertainment and documentary content brought to you by Nashvillians. Find the official site at weownthistown.net or follow us at We Own This Town on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. You'll get updates about the latest episodes from every show across the network. As we are wont to do on episodes ending in a five or zero, this week we are doing something a little bit different than our regular playlist style episode. Yes, there was a ton of great new music released this past week. Yes, we're going to give it coverage. Yes, it's all incredible and we want to promote it as much as possible. Smart objects, I'm looking at you. But this is a guest that I've been wanting to catch up with for some time now, so I'm taking this opportunity and going with it. This week, I speak with Jeremy Ferguson, founder and proprietor of Battle Tapes Recording, a studio nestled in East Nashville for the past 17 years. The list of albums and artists that Ferguson has worked with in that space is absolutely mind-boggling. Honestly, some of my 100% all-time favorite records were recorded in there. Back in January, he won a Best Rock Grammy for his work on the Cage the Elephant album, Social Cues. While it's quite an impressive accolade, he's quick to point out that Grammy winning is not something he pursued or feels particularly passionate about, though it does make his parents happy. We talk about a myriad of topics, from the state of the streaming music industry, to the impact COVID had on his ability to record, to the beauty of human error, a process that a lot of artists seem to be keen on polishing out of existence. I won't spoil it, but I absolutely love his insight on the topic. So let's just get right into it. You can find Jeremy at Battle Tapes, one word, on Twitter and Instagram or at BattleTapes.com. And without further ado, here we go. Cool. Thank you so much for uh, for having a little chat today. Totally. Totally. My pleasure. I don't know that I like, I, I wrote some stuff down that I want to ask you, but I don't have like a, a hardcore agenda. Cool. Yeah. No, I mean, whatever's fine with me. Well, I guess where we should start is, you know, kind of basic Jeremy Ferguson battle tapes introduction. What's your backstory? Very lightly. You don't have to go way deep, but you know. How did you get started in all this? And like, you were a you were a Murfreesboro grad, right? Correct. Yeah, I grew up in Southern Indiana. In my middle teen years, I kind of started getting into recording based on kind of being like there were a handful of people that played music in the early to mid nineties. There, yeah, you know, I played some, and I found that if I didn't want to just like watch them have band practice or whatever, then my way to get involved was recording. So I did that. I tried going to a normal college. Purdue for a couple of years and transferred to MTSU and kind of just went for the recording thing. You know, I was there until 2003 and then I moved up to Nashville and been here for the last 17 years. And you were involved with a bunch of bands too, not just recording, but you were in bands and stuff in Murfreesboro, right? Yeah. I mean, I was in an instrumental band called Mercator and... Um, Big fan. Yeah, fan yeah, of yeah. I, I really don't remember much about. I, I heard some of the songs. Like somebody sent me some last year. I think maybe Mike Shepard sent me some songs, and I was like, oh yeah, I totally forgot these songs. And then I was just kind of like, oh wow, I could I could have done better. <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, it, yeah, I think that you know we were popular at that time for a thing. And I didn't. I mean, I played with a couple other little bands here and there, but that was kind of like my main thing. So you moved to Nashville, and did you immediately set up shop with Battle Tapes and just start with whatever gear you could kind of get your hands on? Yeah, I mean, so I had kind of accumulated some gear from like age 16 or 17, um, and I pretty much used that until it disappeared or until it broke. And so that was, you know... 94, 95. So I had accumulated maybe like an interface and some some more microphones and some preamps and stuff. And then uh, this guy named Tony Reed uh, was my studio partner when I first moved up here. So the two of us were building out the basement to record. He kind of got busy doing like lights professionally and live installation stuff. So I kept going and I was also getting a lot busier. So it was hard for us to kind of like share the space. But you know, we came up here, I had some stuff. I was still kind of like working day jobs just to try to make ends meet because it took a good six months just to try to get like situated in the house, I suppose. I was working some at a studio called Alex the Great at that time as well. So, you know, it was kind of like a back and forth for me, whatever I needed to do, so pretty much. 
when bands came to you at that time, did you have like a particular kind of, I don't know, ethos or, or like way of thinking about it? Or was it just like, let's record everything, anything and everything that comes to me. Let's just learn from, from all the different genres and yeah. techniques and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I felt like that was kind of the thing. I just recorded whatever. I mean, to some extent, I still do a little bit, you know, I'm not, I'm not overly picky and choosy, which some people always ask. They're like, hey, do you like, you know, really like sort through your bands before you record them? And I'm like, I mean, if somebody wants to work with me, uh, I'm kind of interested in that. And they're always kind of bummed sure. out like, oh, you mean I didn't pass the test? And I'm just like, you know, there's there's no test. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, I, I remember like some people would be like, what are you working on back in like 2005? And I'd be like listening 12 records and they were happening all at the same time. But it was just because... Everybody had day jobs. I right. took on as many things as I could because none of them paid very much and I just needed to make ends meet and I was learning a lot and it was a lot of fun, so. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that this is the case so much anymore. Well, maybe, maybe a little, but you, you've you always been sort of known as like flexible in terms of payment. Like, yeah. It doesn't seem like you let that be a blocker to working with you. I'm sure there are thresholds, minimum thresholds. Yeah. But you, you know, it doesn't seem like you're just like, eh, I, I like what you're doing, kid, but sorry, you know, yeah. I work with you. Yeah, I mean, especially back then, I would do pretty much whatever and make it work. And I tell a lot of people that I'm like, you know, when you're starting off and when you're trying to get your name, when you're trying to figure out how you do things, you kind of have to just do them. And, you know, if you can't get a whole lot of money out of it, then that's just the way it is. Sometimes you just got you're just going to have to, like, figure out a way to find that time and have a job that pays things. Right. I mean, it still is kind of like that. I guess I've gotten enough quote unquote legitimized artists coming in or people who consider what I'm doing enough that they're not going to be too weird about paying. But yeah, I mean, it used to also just be that people just didn't want to pay anything. And and I just, I understood. I mean, I, I was in a band in college and I recorded myself and other bands, but I also went to like Brian Carter and other people and I knew what it took to kind of save money to then kind of like decide to spend that on right. my art or whatever, you know. And I'm not like a wealthy person. I've never been. So I understand that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you do an, an incredibly great job of uh, kind of democratizing that in a way and, and understanding that position. But I do think that you've absolutely legitimized yourself. I mean, not to jump too far ahead, but Cage the Elephant's social cues won a Grammy. Right. And you you made that record. Yeah. You are a Grammy award-winning producer now, is that right? Yeah. Is that the well, I was the engineer on that credit? record. So. The engineer on that record. Yeah, so I mean, to me, it's like, yeah, I mean, it's, it, people can kind of validate that how they need to for themselves, you know. But yeah, I mean, for me, it's if nothing else, it's just like I've been doing it 17 years in this house and I'm like, you know, in my 40s now. I've put up with all the crap type stuff. And while I still do put up with that kind of stuff, I have <laughs> worked it out to a point where I'm like efficient with what I do. I work at a kind of a high level of operation. So it's people don't want to pay anything, especially in music. And they probably get that from the labels on down. <laughs> so totally. I don't know. Winning some accolades. Yeah, yeah, feels totally. good. I think, you know, it's always nice when you've been doing something long enough to have some people be like, oh, yeah, hey, cool. Good job. And I'm like, all right. It filled my heart with joy to see a picture of you on stage yeah. wearing sunglasses, accepting a Grammy. Yeah. I mean, that's it was amazing. That yeah, was cool. It made my parents super, super happy. And that's that's <laughs> kind of like one of the best things. That's the validation that you've you've wanted this whole time. Yeah. It's like, no, it's worth it. <laughs> I'm see? not a screw off. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think. You know, you've also just worked with, like you said, balancing 12 records at a time. Mm -hmm. I was thinking back through the YK Records catalog just recently of the things that you've worked on. And there's, it's just an immense list. Like, yeah. you did the Black Bra record, which is like psych rock with, you know, Riot Girl. You did the Prudish View, which is like this insane kind of pop record. Weird pop, yeah. Tower Defense's upcoming record. You did that. And I mean, the list just goes on and on. But there's no like genre through line. Like, you really didn't ever, it doesn't seem like you ever settled on, I do this thing. Yeah. Like, you, you seem to have pretty wide open ability to take on just about any kind of genre. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I find interest in a lot of music. I have felt like there are times where a record may have success and may kind of pigeonhole me in like, one genre or being focused on a certain type of band and that's never proven to be true which is good because i get bored really easy with like the same thing 
I enjoy different genres or different ways that people make music so that I can be like, oh, hey, this one I get to like really show off like the size of a drum kit or something. And this one is like more about guitars or strings or whatever else, you know. So each one kind of like because those break up in different ways, I can kind of focus on different people or different things in a really cool way where I'm like, all right, well, you know, this is to me not that much different necessarily outside of like maybe instrumentation or volume, you know. Hmm. It's pretty fascinating. I mean, just thinking about the difference between Tower Defense, a band with like two bass players mm-hmm. and four people singing, and then you recorded the Nashville ambient ensemble. Yeah. You know, like, and then you've done country records too, as far as I know. Yeah, like, some. That's pretty divergent. Yeah. Like they all kind of coalesce in your mind. Like it's just, it's just instrumentation at the end of the day. Well, I mean, you know, it's like some of the more country type stuff I've done, I guess is like, really kind of more like pop stuff in some ways or the Americana type thing. And usually there's a producer involved in that kind of thing, which is like another dynamic where you're just like being in a team a little bit more than like technical and performance, you know, Mm -hmm. like me and here and them and there. So I, I enjoy that kind of stuff from time to time just to kind of like pick somebody else's brain or to have somebody else who's kind of like making decisions that I don't have to at that moment. So I can just purely focus on sound or whatever. But, you know, things like the Nashville Ambient Ensemble was like a lot of direct inputs and a lot of synthesized things that I don't usually do in a live setting. So for me, that was fun. Like if I were to do that all the time, it would be tedious because of the number of connections and the number of things to like try to troubleshoot as far as ground noise and different things. But like with that, it was really cool because it was a lot of guys and girls that were just kind of like in a room, here's all their stuff. There's no drums to really like kind of cross talk and anything else. So everything in the room was kind of just like of a similar volume. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, literally once I plugged everything in and I didn't have any kind of like hum or something that was a weird technical issue, I was just like, oh, this is great. We're, we're good to go and we're doing it to tape <laughs> so I can do some fun stuff. And then like a rock band is typically the thing where everybody's like, oh, with like a tower defense thing, everybody's going to get in the room pretty much going to be like right. a live thing. So you get a little bit more of that like. It's almost like going to a show that you get to hear the same song maybe 10 times or something like that. And, right, uh, right. you know, and you can hear it better. So I don't know. I mean, I, I think you find ways to kind of keep yourself interested in that sort of thing or involved or engaged. And I think that, yeah, having having some variety there is really helpful for me. You were saying that, you know, when there's a team situation, like there's another producer involved or something like that, it kind of benefits you in a way because you get to step back and focus on the sounds and be an engineer a little bit. What's your preference or or does it maybe not matter when a band comes to you and would you prefer that the songs be like fleshed out and you're just getting the optimal sound out of what those versions are or... Would you like them to maybe be more open to working out and finishing those songs kind of with you in the space? I think I saw something on your Instagram recently with like a bunch of people sitting around in a circle kind of like figuring out what this song was. And your caption was just like, it's kind of incredible to see this process like happen right here. But I don't know. Maybe it's just depends on the, the day. Maybe some days you're like, yeah, let's just get this done. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of times where I'm just like, let's just get this done. I like to work and I like to get things accomplished. I don't enjoy doing 10 takes of a song if a band is rehearsed and is supposed to know a song. Right. The picture you're speaking of is like Eric Slick and his band. So he had demoed all these songs and the band had heard these. But as far as them actually interacting with each other or talking about ideas or anything else, that hadn't happened at all. There was no rehearsal. Interesting. So... Yeah, they were learning them, and Eric was playing the guitar, and then he would go back behind the drum kit, and the guitar would then go to Sean, or maybe Andy. But, like, that was really cool, because really, I think within five takes, we'd probably have the master take. So, for me, that's really exciting to be like, okay, historically, I know that the people who made these really exciting records in the 50s and 60s, who are session guys, have told me, they're like... The reason that it sounds exciting is because we are all scared shitless once we got there because somebody was just like, (laughs) you know, like make us a hit. We're paying for this. You've got like four hour blocks at that time. And, you know, I think that there is something to people performing well under pressure if they're good at their job. I think that it kind of like lifts the excitement a little bit. I feel like it like comes across on tape or on computer or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's like an intangible thing. Yeah, and so that kind of thing translates really well to me. And 
that's why if a band has already written a song, I'm hoping that we're going to get it in the first two or three takes. Hopefully they're not even comfortable in the studio yet. And they're like complaining about their mix or they're like, oh, I think I screwed up the second verse. And you listen back and you're like, that sounds incredible. You wouldn't do that better. And you could never do that again if you really focused on it. And so when they're writing in the studio, that kind of stuff can happen a lot easier. Sometimes dependent on the musicianship, sometimes dependent on like the natural gelling in the room. That, you know, that's exciting for me when, you know, we have to sit down and labor over things that really don't need to be labored over because that also gets translated when somebody's tense and they're just like really like overthinking it. That kind of stuff comes off in a recording and, uh, you know, I'm not going to mention any names or anything, but there are uh, countless (laughs) records that I've done where people have like had the vocal take or the part and then somebody else talked them out of it or they talked themselves out of it and redid it and it sounds better in some way you know like maybe it's like executed really cool or something but it's not like doesn't have the feeling that the other thing had which they don't get you know like they're embarrassed by something that you're just like that's incredible that that kind of opens the door to the question of like i guess like 10 15 years ago there was a lot of debate about like pro tools and like cleaning everything up and everything being perfect yeah i feel like that subsided a little bit but you're kind of getting at this bigger notion of like this intangible human element that's just like the way someone's feeling when they're performing that you can't necessarily you couldn't do anything in pro tools with that like that's just a a natural thing that happens while they're performing i mean do you feel like that is something that has become less common that like there is so much of a desire to be perfect and do everything possible in pro tools that like it's okay to have a little human error in there because there's something emotional about that, like a lilt in the voice or something, or or even a um, fuck up on the guitar. Like there's something about that, that you might not even notice it listening, but it's, it's a error technically that actually secretly makes you love the track. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, those are the moments that I at least really hope for. Uh, I used to kind of like seek them out and then like argue for them more than I do now. And I still do if I'm producing something or if it's like, it's my vision. But yeah, I mean, you know, you like listen to Beatles and Beach Boys, maybe less Beach Boys, but like at least Beatles stuff, you know, if you're lucky enough to ever like listen to like track breakdowns, which you can on YouTube, uh, you, you can hear all kinds of weird pitchy stuff happening in the background. Like all that kind of stuff is in the track. You don't necessarily hear it, think about it, but it's, you know, subliminally it's happening. Yeah, I mean, I don't even know how to explain something to me that is, is like a fundamental of recording kind of like the process. But, you know, that that being said, like, there's a lot of stuff that I clean up still to this day that you wouldn't think is like perfect or isn't, you know, it's like it's like learning how to do things in a way that make things make more sense or be presented in a way that they don't sound overly perfect but they still move together, I suppose. And it's, and it's weird because like, I haven't been doing as many bands from out of town lately, but- What with the, the COVID? Well, I mean, just like maybe even in the last <laughs> year or so, you know, it's like, it's been kind of mixed bag, but it used to be there to have bands come in from like Georgia or New York or wherever, and it would be a band as opposed to like an artist. And they could have great songs and all be good players, but the way that they played together was kind of like, you know, and I don't want to generalize, but I mean, it was just like I could tell the difference between people who lived in Nashville, even if they weren't from here, and the people that existed everywhere else as far as just tightness and those kinds of things. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, and that's not to say that there aren't like a million times better bands in other places as well. But, you know, as far as like what I deal with directly. And so within that, like there was a lot of stuff that I would have to fix it, and it would still sound kind of rough and tumble. So it's not like I made it like, oh, where's the drum machine and the MIDI guitars or whatever else. But yeah, I I mean, it's complicated. Before it was a thing where people were new to a technology possibly that allowed them to do more than they ever thought they could. And a lot of people that were starting to get into it were probably like a bunch of kids who played video games and were like, oh, hey, you know, like this is kind of like when I play the game or when I was in Photoshop, I can do this now, but it was audio and that's what I'm into. Right. So... I don't know. I I have never really had that much of an issue with it because I don't think anybody's ever like 
accuse any of my recordings of being too perfect, even the things that are like largely electronic and sequenced, you know? Well, sure. But that doesn't mean you can't have an opinion on what other people are doing. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's so much of that comes down to just like if the person clicks with what I like which is what I like about that. Cause there are people who loves that kind of stuff. You know, there are people who just want to hear pristine records and everything is perfect and there's nothing, there's no mistakes and it's super clean. And I'm not that person most of the time. And I'm not the person who's going to make most of those records. So it's nice. You know, that's why we have this big field that people can kind of swim in and be like, yeah, I choose him because he's this way. So, you know, my opinion varies. Like I probably felt like really, aggressive about some of those things at different points in my life. Just like at one point I was just like, Grammys are a bunch of shit, you know, like I, if I ever win one, then I'm just part of the big problem of like this commercial garbage music that is out there pervading like the airwaves. And then it's like, I had a kid and I have to listen to some of those pop things sung by other kids and kids bop. And I'm just like, Hey, this song's not that bad, I guess, you know, it's just like, I don't want to hear it on the radio and I don't want to hear this shit all the time. But like, there's something to it and the way that she gets stuff out of it is really cool, you know, like um, hearing it through her ears, which is the disconnect whenever you're a peer with somebody and they like some music that you don't like because you're like, well, you're a fucking douchebag and I don't want to be anything like you and I don't associate with you. So it's really easy for me to say I don't want to be a part of this. But, you right. know, like my kid's not a douchebag. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, and let's all Let's all hope that our like most cantankerous opinions from when we were 23 of, yeah. you know, subsided in the years following. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, if not, then geez, I don't think anybody would want to be in a room with me if I kept all the opinions I've had my whole time. Same here for sure. So I wanted to ask you about like, you're, you're speaking a little bit about it with the, the industry and, you know, you're part of the problem or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm curious to hear what you think is the problem right now the state of the industry with streaming i think for me that's the number one thing that comes up is like the inability to make money through your music just being streamed and how hard that is yeah it's always been hard to be a band but it seems like it's been getting progressively harder right to be a band yeah particularly an independent band which i think you don't necessarily only work with independent bands but you have a great deal of experience with them yeah and them questioning why they haven't blown up or like why they're not rich yet you know it's it's weird i I'm always slightly anti-establishment in the way that I look at things. I've always been like really big into DIY stuff and independence and your own terms as far as like those things go. There were a handful of labels that I grew up really liking. I started off loving like total garbage pop music and still listen to that kind of stuff when I started getting into interesting music and moved away from that. And now I'm kind of like this hybrid person again who can listen to different things. As a person who sees what people put into creating records or creating their art and what it costs them versus what they get back from it. You know, it's like they choose to make records for their own reasons. And that's great. I love that. If they don't get back what they need in order to continue doing that or to justify doing that in their own minds, then that could be a loss or it could just be thinning of the herd type thing. We have so much music now. Yeah. And maybe because we have so much music now and because it's so easy to access, people have devalued it to some extent because there's always going to be somebody who's going to just be like, well, they, you don't want to pay for their music. You can have mine for free. Dealing with a band like cage. I mean, they actually make some money off of streaming, but it's like the number of streams they get is obscene, you know, like hundreds of millions and stuff like that. So, it makes sense that they should make some money off that. I have nothing against the access to music. I just know that companies like Spotify are making like record profits. I don't know comparatively to labels what they've done in the past per year or anything like that, but it seems like they've swallowed up a lot of that money and it's gotten kind of obscene to me. And when their head comes out and says that people need to be more engaged and create more content so that they can sell it and then make more money, the only people that I hear arguing for that are the people who are like buying into that and creating what I'd almost consider to be disposable content. Like, you know, I had a slight argument on Twitter with the guy that had poop in my fingernails or whatever the fuck song that was. And he's just like, it's great. I made a bunch of money. And I'm like, not everybody's trying to make parody music for 13 year old boys dude like 
if you're happy right. at the end of the day doing that and you can make that kind of money and think that somebody's streaming it 200 billion times or something making you like quite a bit of money I suppose is a good thing then cool but I mean to me it's just kind of like it's a bunch of shit and if that guy had made the same thing as a weird owl or something in the 80s he would be you know loaded so he just doesn't see that you know I see bands that are like really psyched to get like a hundred plays or a thousand plays. And I'm just like, all right, cool. That person is doing it because they need to get their music out there. And this is a good Avenue. But then people who start getting like tens of thousands of streams and things like that, it just seems like them getting a check for like a hundred bucks is disgusting to me. Yeah, uh, It's not, a, it's not a good business model and it's, 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 it's insulting. I can understand that that's happened with film as well, but like, the price for a movie ticket has only gone up. The price for the concessions is, have only gone up and movies are still making box office records. Maybe because the price of the ticket has gone up and people are still going, but like how that, that model can't be used at all in music doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. And the fact that you have like artists who are actually successful who then argue for it and are like championing Spotify and being like, it's the greatest. You guys just need to suck it up and get used to it. It's just like, fuck you. You're in a really privileged position. And if you weren't, yeah. if you sold like 10,000 less records or something, you would be bitching just like everybody else. Totally. <laughs> it's a big thing to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is totally a big thing. I, I, you know, I read about it a lot and think about it a lot because it is, it is hard. Like musicians probably shouldn't be making music exclusively with the intent of making money because it's very hard. Exactly. And I don't think that anybody should like, you know, I, if any band were to come up to me and be like, or if anybody were to come up to me and be like, all right, so I'm going to start playing music or I'm going to start making records because I want to be rich, then I'd tell them, get the fuck out of my face. You're, you're crazy. <laughs> I don't know what you're on. I don't want any of it. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I want, I want musicians to make money. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, yeah. But I think that being your driving intent yeah. is a bad move. Yeah, totally. Completely. Yeah. With any art, really. Yeah, for sure. I've been reading about this thing called the user centric payment system, mm -hmm. UCPS. And there's like the Spotify of France is called Deezer. Uh -huh. And they've been like really pitching this UCPS that basically is like a one to one. Like if you pay us $9 a month and you only play tower defense songs, your $9 goes to tower defense. We don't just like throw all your money in a pot right. and then decide who should get money from that pot it's one-to-one -one what you listen to that's cool and i think that's just so fair and sensible but the gatekeepers in between the artist and the streaming platform are never going to go for that yeah. it's going to be such a hard thing to adopt yeah no that's great i mean i i mean that yeah that kind of stuff does make sense to me um i don't see why it can't be done labels do get probably quite a bit of money from Spotify and things like that. And I don't know if that's really accounted for for most artists to see what they're actually getting out of that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it's a weird thing. I mean, top down, it's a weird thing. But, you know, the whole music industry has been people trying to take advantage of each other for a long time. And, you know... Since the beginning, Since right? the beginning, it's been pretty screwed up and really, like, there have been a million things. But that's, you know, that goes both ways. You know, like, when I was at the Village Quarter in L.A., I went to their gear room and I was picking out pieces and they had one, and I think it was like the Exciter or whatever it was called. And it had some dobs and some meters on it and stuff like that. And I was just like, this looks really cool. What is this? And they're like, well, in the 70s and the 80s when bands would come in here and they would have like big cocaine habits, they would put that on the record tab and then they would put in the invoice this one piece of gear. And it was just kind of like, I think that it, either knocked things up by a couple decibels or took things down, but there was nothing to it. It was just this passive thing. And so like the A&R would come in and be like, what is that? And they would like kick it on and it would get a little bit louder and they're like, ooh. But you know, like bands were just <laughs> using it as a front. So I mean like, you know, who, who knows how much of like the industry is still trying to get back from like the cocaine budgets that Fleetwood Mac had in the late seventies and early eighties. I don't, I don't know. Oh yeah. I mean, even as recent as the nineties. I mean, oh yeah. I mean, you know, like I, I built websites for now. That's what I call music. The compilation series yeah. back in the late nineties, early two thousands. And they sent us gold records. Like 
this sold however many copies. Send the web designers a copy of the gold record. Yeah. It's like those things probably cost like a thousand dollars to make. Yeah. And they printed, you know, they just made a ten extra ones and sent them off to everyone involved. It was like I just put it in my basement. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean I have a whole bunch of my one time father in laws in my basement. I mean, that's the very tip of the iceberg in terms of recording industry abuses. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. For sure, yeah. Yeah. But getting less esoteric, I, I would love to hear things that you've been working on recently that you're allowed to talk about, things that have come out recently, things that are coming up recently, just things for people to know about. I'm just, I'm just curious what you're working on. Well, right before quarantine started and all that, uh, I was doing a record with this guy named Brett Denon and a guy named Austin Jenkins producing Austin... Uh, I guess, quote unquote, found Leon Bridges and has been a producer for him. And we have a record that's a mastering right now that I think is fun. And I like the way it sounds a lot. After that, I had a whole bunch of stuff booked that just fell through, obviously. But mm -hmm. um, I mixed a record by a band called Have a Rad Day. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're more on the emo side, which it's like not my thing at all. But the record is really cool and fun. And we found some compromises in, in that aspect. And um, it is being mastered right now as well. Yeah, I like what I've heard from them so far. And I enjoy a band that can have their name acronymed. Yeah, hard. <laughs> yeah, I always just call them hard and people are like, what? And I'm just like, yeah, hard. And they're like, I'm like Thomas's band, you know, oh, have a rad day. Yeah, yeah. So um, I did that. We are always doing some kind of cage, the elephant type stuff when they're not on tour the last couple years. So I think I've mixed a couple things, like another radio single got remixed and we started writing the next record stuff here. So are you, are you on more of a producerly role or? Uh, I would say I'm just role? engineering still uh, at this point. Like, you know, there are six guys in that band. So it's like, I am not uh, assertive enough to be like, you guys are writing songs right now. Well, let me stick my face in and tell you how we're going to do it. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I'm just kind of sitting here engineering and throwing up sounds or trying to keep it interesting for them, just kind of like I've always done. And there's a band called The Glove from Florida with Brad from Cage uh, producing it that we worked on in April, I think, for like a week. They came up from Florida. We're almost done with that record. It's a really cool kind of New Order type synthy yeah. record. I don't know. It'll get picked up by somebody and it'll come out. In December, we did a new Lamb Chop record called Trip, and they're going to announce that uh, this next Tuesday. And it's really cool. We just basically, he didn't want to tour for one of the tours they had booked and wanted to just kind of make a record with the guys who were going to tour anyways instead. And then they played those shows in Nashville at uh, Dark Matter. Yeah. So yeah, we had a fun week of doing like some covers and some stuff like that. And I think the first one will be out maybe next week. And then we've already got another thing pretty much done. Wow, that's exciting. Yeah. So I think that'll go to Baldwin for mastering like pretty soon. Did a live bully thing because they can't tour. They have to make videos, you know? Yeah. Like went to Dark Matter and recorded them playing some songs and it was filmed. That's cool. And mixed that. Oh, and I'm thinking of like Prudish View. Todd Kemp's kind of counterpart musically to me is Ryan Irvin uh, from the Carter administration because they spent mm -hmm. so much time together. And uh, Ryan and I did some stuff with Todd Drumming recently, another four, three or four songs. So oh, cool. uh, I think we just finished those recording. I got to mix some stuff. I feel like I'm definitely forgetting something. So anybody's listening to this. I can personally attest that I have something coming out on YK that we haven't mentioned that hasn't been announced that you definitely recorded. Yeah, so. it's one of my favorite things, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. Um, so I'm sure that that's just a, a minor list of the things that you have worked on. Yeah. I mean, it's been a while since we last spoke, um, even over email, about all the things. So yeah. I imagine the list is very, very long. Yeah. And with like a five-year-old and virtual learning and yeah. spending half my day with that, it's like my memory lately is just is completely shit. And it's just embarrassing to me in a lot of ways. But uh, but yeah, I just totally can't really remember everything <laughs> at any point. Yeah, totally. I'm not in that position at all, and I also have those memory problems. So yeah, I guess we're just I think old. It's maybe just you know part of age. Yeah. If you asked me to name like track titles from my favorite album last year, I couldn't do it. No. Like I couldn't tell you a song title of something I've enjoyed recently. It just doesn't stick in my brain anymore. Yeah, I can barely tell you song titles of things that I've like spent weeks working on and looking at the <laughs> stupid screen and being like, oh yeah, there it is. Don't remember. 
that song you know the drums so it's awesome um so has everything been like i probably should have asked this at the top but with covid and you know a kid and virtual learning and not really being able to get together into a room like have you made any adjustments to the way you're you're doing stuff or is it just you've gotten to a point now where like you you understand the distance they understand the distance it's and it feels less panicky i don't know yeah um well like with the cage guys we do testing and we all wear masks everybody's pretty much been masking up for sessions anyways i don't know it's it's definitely strange because for me i was so booked out going into the whole thing and I kind of had like plans with income and different things that I was going to use for expanding things or whatever else that just kind of fell apart. And so it's not been like awful, like for some people where I'm like, Oh my God, how am I going to make ends meet as much as being like, well, I've got enough to make ends meet, but all the stuff that I had planned has kind of fallen to the wayside, which has happened to me in the past anyways, due to other life experiences experiences or whatever but like i don't know like that's kind of the biggest thing for me shifting gears to like working by myself and mixing um without like people around and you know waiting on feedback on things in some ways it's been good because i had such a huge backlog of mixing things and things that i just hadn't been able to get around to but i definitely like felt maybe like a false sense of all right here we go like after the grammy thing in january because i was just like man this is gonna be a busy year and i'm just gonna do a lot of stuff and then i'm gonna take a vacation and take my kid to florida and and then it was just kind of like i'm gonna sit in my room or in my house and uh (laughs) and uh try to see where i was at like six months ago with this record that i now need to mix i don't know i mean you know, like most engineers who are like, oh, it's built for this. I mean, I can <laughs> I can be alone with the best of them. But, right. you know, there's definitely something more enjoyable about making records with people and interacting with people. And you get annoyed with it whenever you're doing it every single day and you don't have any time off. But then whenever it goes away, it's just like, shit, man, like my motivation is just gone. You know, the mm-hmm. person pushing me or making me pissed off that I have to work on this or whatever kind of gets you going. It's not necessarily there. And maybe they're also kind of like in a place where they're like, well, shit, you need to finish this, but I don't know if I have the money now because my life or, you know, whatever else. So I don't know. You got to consider those things. Like my mixing rate during that stuff went way down out of nowhere. And I was just like, all right, well I'll make less money, but I guess that also makes it so somebody can complete the record, which is at the end of the day, just as important as anything else you know, getting it out there. Well, I'm sorry to hear that plans change so much. Oh, I mean, they did for everybody, you know, like I don't, yeah. you know, I, I, I can't say that I feel like slighted in any way. <laughs> like it's all, right. this fuckers ruined my life. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's really weird. Fortunately, my kid's only five, so it's a strange thing for her, but it's not like massive and you know existential like what is the world it's just like yeah oh hey we have to wear masks so (laughs) i feel the same way 2020 i thought going into 2020 i was like oh this is going to be a magical year 2020 yeah i mean just the sound of it i can't wait what a cool year this is going to be i'm going to get married this year i'm going to like yeah and then it was just like like no this year sucks for everybody yeah yeah i yeah (laughs) you're like one of like four or five couples i know who have like had to push the marriage part like or at least any kind of celebration we're not personally slighted it wasn't you know same with you wasn't an attack on us but it's just hard um yeah i would love to end this interview on a upbeat sure yeah Yeah, anything please I think my burning question, my number one burning question that I've had for years is battle tapes, one word or two. All right. So technically it's battle tapes recording three words. That's the LLC like title, the official word. And then as you had to like create, because I mean, this started in 2002 before like Friendster and all that other kind of crap. So as those things came on and I was just like, I'll just use this so I don't have to put my name, I would take it down to one word as battle tapes. But it was strictly because I didn't want to put a dash or, a, you know, an underscore or anything else in there. Because I was just like, then people will screw it up. So really, battle tapes, when people like put it on a credit, I'm hoping they have it as battle tapes or battle tapes recording. 
but then you know like i don't mind because also some people just use that as a nickname for me in which case if they use it as one word or whatever i don't really care but yeah technically three words or two words all these years i've been saying it as one word no i mean that's which is fine you know it's like john from hot pipes always calls me tapes and stuff and i'm just like you have known me forever before that just call me jeremy <laughs> but you know there's no wrong there so yeah well i mean really it's kind of like whatever B- bt battle tapes battle tapes recording yeah whatever you're at battle tapes on pretty much all the things right yeah well twitter, twitter and, and instagram. instagram i don't have a facebook candace had set one up at that. one point and i think that like one friend, Jeremy Fetzer, who has like been doing some logos for me and stuff, was just like, I'm going to design you a new web page and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. And I was just like, yeah, I mean, you know, whatever you feel like, I suppose. Like, I don't know that I need any of those things. So that will probably be Battle Tapes recording or something. But everything else at Battle Tapes, Battle Tapes at Gmail, 615 Battle Tapes. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I hope everyone will go and follow you on all those services and see you call out people for writing stupid songs and then see you kind of document all these processes that you're going through. And Yeah, uh, my life. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. So Pretty girl. Thanks for sharing all that. Yeah. Thank you for sharing all of this insight as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have a feeling we will catch back up with you, you know, periodically. Cool. You're involved with so much local music that yeah. uh, it'd be it'd be unfortunate not to. Yeah, hopefully I will um, remain busy here. I mean, you know, it's completely different than it was 17 years ago when I started. There were like 500 studios in the area net then, and now there's probably like 5,000. So I'm just glad that I have things to do, especially yeah, lately. For sure. So yeah, I'll be around. Well, cool. All right. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you so much to Jeremy for taking the time to talk with me. In hindsight, I have a million more questions for him, but I will just have to save those for a future talk. Hopefully we can get him to come around a bit more regularly. Once again, find him at Battle Tapes on Twitter and Instagram, one word, or at BattleTapes.com. Find us at We Own This Town on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, or keep an eye on WeOwnThisTown.net for updates about all the new episodes from all of our wonderful We Own This Town shows. Next week, we'll get back to our regular style playlists of featuring a bunch of new music from around town, so hit us up on the DMs and send us the music that we should hear and that we should be featuring. It does work. It's a process that does work, I promise. The music bed for this episode is brought to you by Upright T-Rex Music. Find them at UprightTRexMusic.com. Take care, wear a mask, stay healthy. Bye.